doping in cycling. Hi guys, I'm Dan at VintageVelo.org and today uh, we're doing a video on doping in cycling. Uh, now, I've got to be honest, it's not really a video I wanted to make. Uh, we all know most of the history of doping in cycling. Uh, we have a fairly rich, well-documented uh, history of it. And uh, it's also of note, although sunny, uh, this is freezing cold today. Uh, the temperature is not above zero and I probably should have done a video on how to uh, multi-layer to stay warm uh, on a bike. But doping in cycling. I felt compelled to do this video uh, mainly because there are so many um, videos on doping uh, on the uh, internet and I just felt um, it needed a, a fresher look at it especially you know there are whole channels devoted to the subject uh, and uh, sometimes I just think uh, they're a little bit overall negative and the reason for that is this year's um, 2022 Tour de France average speed um, now that was higher than it was during the kind of Armstrong era rocket fueled EPO years um, and because it was higher obviously they must all be doping uh, it's an easy conclusion, um, it doesn't require much thought, and, and that's quite clear. Um, I don't think that's the case at all. And the reason for that, there are two very distinct, important reasons. Um, the first is that the technology is now so, so much better. Um, and by that, I mean aero bikes, aero positioning, uh, diet, fitness, nutrition, uh, coaches, everything like that. And don't belittle it, that makes an enormous difference. Uh, say for example, uh, 1995, I think it was, or maybe 1997, uh, Chris Bourbon took the hour record. Um, now, that record still stands today. The reason why he took the hour record at that point, and it still stands, is because he was in the Superman position, really laying out far in front of the bike in what is now a banned illegal position, um, but very, very, very aerodynamic. And it still stands today as, a, as the fastest achieved human speed on a bike uh, for the hour record. Um, so you can't dismiss aerodynamic advancement. It's a very important thing. But more importantly, the second reason um, is that back in Lance's day, if it was a five and a half hour stage, they didn't race all five and a half hours. Um, there would normally be a half hour battle for the break to get away once it was established uh, then it all calmed down and they probably poodle along at 30 35 kilometers an hour uh, for the best part uh, of two two and a half hours until the tv cameras rolled up and once the live tv coverage went out they started racing um, and let's get around this tight corner uh, apparently uh, you could tell the live tv coverage was on uh, because the, uh, the helicopters appeared overhead and then when that happened full gas racing occurs the hammer goes down and they then do two and a half three hours flat out at those outrageous kind of 55 kilometer an hour average speeds now today it's live coverage from the start there's no pauses there's no uh, breaks we watch from even before on the warm-ups uh, we watch from the neutralized star onwards so those guys are racing from start to finish of that stage and what that means is um, you've got five and a half hours of them holding those 45 ish kilometers an hour speed now if you're doing rotations at the front with all the latest equipment all the latest data you can stay up front and do those kind of speeds in fact if i'm honest I'm surprised they're not going faster and I think in the next couple of years as live data feeds especially from training uh, with the likes of glucose monitors and lactate monitors I think you'll see those average speeds going upwards so those are the reasons tech and data and the fact they race from start to finish on each stage and that equates to a higher average speed than it did back in the days of Lance and rocket fuel So let's take a look now at the bike we're riding today. Uh, it is a stunning uh, Pegoretti made Pinoreno Diner 
Um, uh, it's an ex Bonesto team bike from 1995 and was written by uh, the brilliant climber Jose Chava Jimenez uh, in that year. Excuse my pronunciation, Spanish, not my first language. Uh, now, his is a fitting tragic tale. Uh, a brilliantly gifted climber, a good friend of Marco Pantani, in fact, towards the end of his career, he and Pantani uh, discussed at length opening up their own professional team between them. Uh, and sadly, uh, he died a tragic early death a few months before Pantani died. Uh, again, largely due to the white stuff, cocaine uh, and other assorted drugs. So when anyone says, hey, maybe we should just allow uh, untested uh, riders and let them do whatever they want to do. No, very bad idea. It leads to all sorts of untimely, tragic early deaths. Let's take a look at the progression of doping in cycling through history. Uh, now, it's fair to say that the first professional cyclists uh, were already on doping products pretty much for the moment the first paycheck came in and important to note that wasn't illegal wasn't banned uh, there were plenty of lotions and potions mostly amphetamine based cocaine based strychnine uh, painkillers that kind of thing uh, and uh, that was not illegal at the time now the first ever winner of the tour 1903 Maurice Gower um, now he and five others got banned uh, and dispelled from the uh, 1904 Tour de France because they got on a train. Now, getting on a train was definitely banned um, and they got caught for it and got kicked out. But doping, now that was fine. And as you look through the history uh, of cycling, um, you see, I mean, there's a brilliant video, you can watch it on YouTube, uh, of five-time winner Fausto Coppi and his great rival, Gino Bartali uh, singing and crooning a kind of parody of a song uh, about doping. It's really quite cool. Uh, they thought nothing of it. Um, fi French five-time Grand Tour winner of the Tour de France, Jacques Anquetil. Um, he was once asked candidly in an, in in an interview, uh, "Did you, do you ever use doping products? Uh, and he says, only on occasion when it's absolutely necessary. When asked, how often is that? Almost always was the response. Uh, so, you know, again, it wasn't illegal, wasn't. So then you have to fast forward to 1967 and the tragic death of Tom Simpson at the uh, heights of Mont Ventoux, uh, owing to advanced dehydration, alcohol, and a boatload of amphetamines. Uh, from there on, the ban started coming in. Amphetamines are banned, steroids start getting banned, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's when we start to see kind of what I would call the golden era of cycling, 70s and 80s. Um, the reason why I consider it to be the golden era is because doping there, uh, yeah, sure, it's going on, plenty of amphetamines around, um, but it's very, very low tech. Um, the kind of stuff that's going on, almost always amphetamines, a few painkillers, a few steroids, but steroids and uh, amphetamines are very coarse. They show up in the urine tests and you get banned. As an example of how rudimentary doping was at that point, 1977, I think it was, um, Miguel Polentier uh, was in the running for winning the yellow jersey at the Tour de France that year. He goes through dope control and he's caught uh, with an ampule of someone else's urine under his arm. He's trying to get that out into the, uh, the urine sample, uh, obviously uh, because he's got amphetamines coursing through him. And that's how low tech doping is in the 70s and 80s. Um, and other examples of this, if you read Paul Kimmage's brilliant book, Rough Ride, uh, he explains very clearly uh, certain races are shoddy air races, hot races. Uh, explained to them by their director sportifs beforehand, there's no dope controls. Everyone laughs, slap on the back, can charge up, you're absolutely fine. And these guys knew if they were going to be tested or not. 
Um, and it's not until we come further forward in time that we start to get the really big issues. And for that, we move into the EPO era. Our classic ramp climb coming up. See how this Bernesto goes up. Ah, gotta be about 20%, 25%. Come on. Nice. Still climbing, but not as extreme now. What a day for it. So it's time to talk about the EPO era. Uh, and I guess when we talk about doping in cycling, a majority of it is we are looking at the 15, 20 years of EPO. Uh, and um, it starts in around 1990. Uh, you start to see it appearing uh, with Dutch team PDM and a few of the Italian teams. And it's also marked early on by the untimely tragic deaths of several Dutch athletes um, whose heart stopped in the middle of the night, which now we could attribute to EPO, but back then we didn't really know what was going on. Uh, and within the peloton, excuse me, I am grinding my way up a climb here and there's no EPO in me, so it's a little bit harder. But, uh, yeah, 1990 starts to come through into the peloton slowly. No one really knows what they're doing. No one knows the dosages. Uh, and it's not until about 1992 start to see it really take grip within the peloton the average speeds are really going up and you see guys like Fignon uh, like uh, Le Mans uh, starting to drop away and quitting they know what's going on um, but they're not prepared to do it and then by 1994 it is rampant and it goes not just from being rampant but it gets really scientific. We see there the best example, 1994 flesh well on, one day classic, three Gevis Widers just right off the front, destroy everyone, including a very dejected Lance Armstrong. Uh, and uh, they destroy everyone for an easy victory. And the rest of the peloton are looking on, what's going on? Well, that was Dr. Michele Ferrari, um, a sports scientist, a shamed sports scientist. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's brilliant. He was pioneering lactate tests, threshold tests, um, all sorts of stuff, really data-driven. Unfortunately, when it came to the line in the sand on doping, he wasn't even standing in the sand, let alone looking at a line. It was uh, as much as you could get in you, but he was controlling it and testing it and Lance paid attention and we all know that Lance then started working with Michele Ferrari but then again most of the other teams at that point were bringing in their own uh, team doctors and their team sponsored doping programs we saw that very clearly then 1998 the Festina affair uh, where Willie Voigt the senor is caught going over the border with hundreds of vials and uh, prescriptions of EPO, growth hormone, um, testosterone, cortisone, all sorts of corticosteroids, um, basically because EPO is so good at making you ride further and longer, your body breaks down. You need the testosterone for recovery, you need the corticosteroids for the inflammatories, you need painkillers, it just goes on and on. Um, and that's the rocket fuel era. A continual spiral of taking more and more drugs and more and more doctors and everyone is suspecting that someone else is doing something new and better than you are and that defines the EPO era now after 1998 we all think ah oh, it's gonna calm down now but it doesn't as we all know uh, 1999 Lance comes to the fore and wins five straight Tour de France's uh, much to the uh, upset of Jan Ulrich, who probably should have been winning, uh, but also, you know, as doped up as Lance. Um, and, you know, we come through uh, to uh, 2006, 
the Puerto affair, uh, which is a massive investigation. Uh, Dr. F. Fuentes uh, is busted. Uh, the likes of Basso, Ulrich, all the others, they all go down uh, in the same bust. Um, and you'd think that would clean it up. And it starts to then, because what we're seeing then is the, the total detonation of teams that are caught doing that kind of thing. It just can't carry on. Um, and then in 2000, uh, late 2008, 2010, uh, we start to see uh, the blood passport coming out. And that's a huge game changer uh, because the blood passport is constantly checking your blood values. So if you are doing something naughty, you can't do much because it would show up as a spike. Um, and that really then levels the playing field an awful lot. I'm not for one second saying doping went away, uh, but it got a lot more even, uh, a lot less. And if you weren't doping, you could then start to get back on the podium. Um, and that was very, very key. The blood passport is key to a lot of things. Again, if you look online, there are plenty of experts uh, who will tell you that the blood passport is trash. Um, it really isn't. It's a very, very important document. Uh, and it stops definitely the excesses. Are there small levels of doping still going on? Definitely. Microdosing, uh, probably doesn't really do that much, um, but it's definitely there. Um, if we want to be specific, I would definitely take a closer look at therapeutic use exemptions. Um, but to be fair, there are plenty of ways uh, to get ahead in professional cycling without actually having to resort to banned products. Um, sleeping aids. Uh, painkillers, I mean ibuprofen, <laughs> I mean it's the stuff that runners are built of, um, it's certainly uh, important, I mean because tramadol got banned a couple of years ago, uh, but ibuprofen is still completely legal, uh, caffeine, oh we all love caffeine, um, it is technically banned in high doses, um, but uh, it is certainly allowed, uh, and as I say before, you know we've got an awful lot of data driven uh, resources now, uh, we've got ketones as well, which we don't really understand. Uh, and there's loads of scientific stuff uh, that teams can pursue uh, to their own performance enhancements, uh, but they're not banned. So we don't have to look too closely at this point. So if you're like me, you may wonder why professional cyclists uh, get into dope in the first place. After all, uh, it strikes me that everyone seems to have a, a moral compass set to not doping. Um, and it's when you uh, read uh, a lot of uh, information that's out there, I read a lot of books on the subject, I've read papers on it, and of course, the internet, which is full of every expert, um, you realize, you know, guys like Kimmage, uh, just were ground down into it. They didn't dope much, they didn't want to dope much, they were fervent anti-dopers, uh, but, you know, they just couldn't keep up uh, and they uh, they were just ground down and knackered. Other guys, um, David Miller, notable uh, British time trialist, uh, tour stage winning time trialist, um, you know, he was doing great. Totally uh, fervent anti-doper, uh, riding on bread and water, winning the odd stage here and there, and winning races, big races with confidence, uh, until he got knocked off his bike uh, on a training ride, and his ankle got injured. Uh, and he never could get back to full form after that injury. It was never the same. But he was still the team leader, and put under him immense pressure uh, from uh, the team uh, higher up of management to prepare properly and get back in the game. Uh, and sadly, uh, that's the way that he went and he's regretted it ever since. Uh, and you see this time and time again, basically guys, they, uh, they can do uh, a season or two as a Neo Pro. Uh, and then if it is in that rocket fuel era of EPO, they've just got no chance of doing anything within the pelotons or keeping their contract uh, without doping unless they are of course the one percent uh, of uh, top riders at that time notably Christoph Basson uh, who was able to uh, perform at that level would have won tons uh, if everyone else around him wasn't doping but there are very few and far between examples of Basson out there
So I've beat a hasty retreat back inside because that really is cold out there and my brain has kind of stopped working. Um, and we have to take note, we all love a little bit of espresso. A double espresso is well noted and documented uh, for increasing short-term performance, cognitive thinking, and uh, just generally being really cool for riding a bike. But don't overlook um, you know, Abraham Alano, the Spanish powerhouse ex-world champion from the rocket fuel era. Despite everything he had coursing through his veins, he got failed on his drug test for excess caffeine. Um, so, you know, got to be careful on everything that we talk about here. Um, and yeah, I don't want to get into too many moral standpoints, but I do believe the Peloton now is cleaner than it's ever been. The risks are too high. Um, the technical data that's required is too easily spotted. We saw only last year with the massive raids on Bahrain Meridia. Um, the thing that the police were most looking for was all of the data and the phones and the laptops. They were trying to find out exactly what was going on. No charges completely clear. In fact, the only recent failed test is uh, Quintana. Uh, and his was for our old favourite Tramadol, um, which was certainly very prevalent uh, in the last few years. Wasn't banned. Um, and But it is now. And, uh, you know, I guess some people just can't uh, step away from it. Um, but hopefully um, you might find this video useful. Um, we're all looking forward to a clean future with luck. And um, yeah. Uh, if you like that video, like and subscribe uh, for more vintage rides, uh, vintage builds and anything that's cool to do with bikes. Thanks a lot.